so this session will be about resisting the devil, Christian life under the assaults of the devil. And in the very beginning we can talk a little bit about the cross as part of Christian life. There is no real battle that doesn't include the possibility of suffering. So, suffering and, and bearing the cross is always there when we talk about resisting the devil. In John 14, 27, Christ promises to his disciples, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Yet this is immediately followed by, Not as the world gives do I give to you. The same is repeated by Paul. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. It's probably a very familiar phrase from ending sermons. So, the peace Christians have surpasses all understanding, and it is not as the world gives. It's, it's a different kind of peace. You could say that the source of peace the Christians have is, of course, different. It comes from Jesus. It's, it, it, the, where does the peace come from? That's a different thing. But also... The experience of peace, how do we, we experience this peace, is quite different with Christian peace compared to the worldly peace. So indeed, the source of, or the way of attaining peace is completely different. Worldly peace follows from the people's work for peace, either in the society, in their families, or in their own personal lives. They make peace, and that peace also must be maintained and kept up with conscious human effort. The Christian peace is received as a work of God for us, and in us. As Jesus says, my peace I give to you. So, peace is a gift from Jesus. Now, this doesn't mean that uh, this other kind of peace, you know, like peace between nations, or peace inside our families, is a bad thing. But that's not exactly the Christian peace we are talking about now. No. This is something Jesus gives. The Christian search for peace changes priority of things. In, in the Sermon on the, on the Mount, Jesus says, Therefore do not be anxious. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. He's talking about food and clothing. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Those pursuing worldly peace often focus on securing created benefits like material or immaterial goods, like fame, friendship, or even family. They try to get these first, accepting spiritual needs perhaps only once these more pressing, more real concerns are first satisfied. The Christian search for peace works differently. It puts God's righteousness first, understanding that true peace is found when and only when faith lays hold of Jesus Christ as one's Lord and Savior. Christians trust God's care also in the created goods, created world, you know, clothing and, and, and food. But they know that their true peace still remains even when these things are missing. For example, through poverty, sickness, loneliness, persecution, etc. The peace which is based on unmovable love and grace of God is able to withstand even the hardest troubles of life. So when, when all other sources of peace give away, and it seems there is nothing but misery, still Christian peace remains. And finally, the sense of peace, or peaceful feeling, or feeling peaceful, is not the basis of Christian's peace. The peace Jesus gives to all Christians not only survives the external troubles they may suffer, persecution and, and misery, but also, and especially, the internal worries, anxieties, insecurity, pain, etc. The comforting words of Christ, do not anxious or let not your hearts be troubled, are not meant as a condition one first has to fulfill in order to discover real peace, but rather they are pointing to the fruits or consequences of that true peace. When Christ gives true peace, then and only then our hearts can finally cease to be anxious. It's not the other way around. Christians do not need to be anxious because they have peace with God and the Heavenly Father who takes care of them. 
However, even if they feel anxiety, the foundation of that peace still remains just as well. The Father in heaven still continues to care for them, protect them, etc. The kind of peace and prosperity that is based on God's good creation and seeks to preserve it is, of course, not to be despised, such as helping people live in peace among each other, providing safety for the innocent, respecting all people, etc. But, of course, there is also such a thing as false peace. False peace which seeks to diminish human responsibility in front of God, that doubts the seriousness of God's commandments, thinks one has become a friend of God simply by living decent life, etc. In this sense as well, the peace of which the Christ gives is not like the world gives, but actually quite contrary to how the unbelieving world soothe these people's consciences. The Holy Spirit uses the preaching of the law to produce true repentance, and so such false peace is taken away. Thus the Christian can experience great restlessness, confusion, anxiety, and even sorrow over their sins, which nonetheless does not indicate that anything is going wrong with their faith, quite on the contrary. The false peace, the false, you know, um, death of conscience or the uh, false peace, quietness of conscience and the loss of it doesn't always have to deal with one's conscience. The sense of life, completely focused on career, possessions, position or self-expression, sometimes even friends and family, can produce false peace which can come apart when these things are threatened or simply because the law of God reveals that true lasting peace and happiness is not found in these things, even if they in themselves might be good gifts of God. It's like the rich fool who had enough uh, for years to come and he builds new storehouses for himself. This kind of false peace, you know, he, he says, now so you can rest and you can be merry and everything is going to be fine. This kind of false peace can be taken away whenever these things are threatened or finally as the law of God uh, reveals that all of these are fleeting. Repentance produces restlessness and discontent with life where God is not present. People become dissatisfied. They lose the false peace. And it is also the work of God's Holy Spirit. Bearing the cross is a term which describes the way Christians relate to the sufferings that come upon them, especially those struggles that follow from following Christ. Is bearing a cross, or bearing the cross, a choice a Christian should make? On one hand it is, on the other hand it really isn't. One thing, <clears throat> for example, Luther made very clear in his writing is that true crosses are never self-chosen, they are not self-made. The idea that a Christian should purposefully seek out suffering just to, in order to imitate Christ's struggles, is wrong. Self-imposed crosses are not true, just like self-produced repentance is not true repentance. At worst, seeking out suffering, trying to make yourself miserable, in, in this way would mean tempting God. So, you can't go out looking to be, looking to bear cross. But on the other hand, the cross will find you. The cross is unavoidable. It is not for Christians to know when, how, and where they are presented with a cross to bear, but they can be certain that it will come. Jesus says, whoever wants to be my disciple shall take up his cross and go in my footsteps. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in, in his Cost of Discipleship, wrote, When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. To be a Christian is to uh, accept that you are following Jesus Christ on the road to the cross. Like he, he went all the way to Golgotha and you will go to your personal Golgotha, wherever that will come. Of course, Christians can choose to bear the cross or not to bear it when it's presented to them. Almost always there is a choice a Christian can make, which seems like it would end the suffering. Give up the burdensome task, or stay quiet, even when called to confess Christ, 
avoid responsibility of others, refuse to repent one's sins, break the promise that proves inconvenient, etc. In some cases, the suffering itself is unavoidable, but one's disposition to it can still be chosen. Shall I accept the suffering from God, trusting in His goodness, or shall I give in to hate and bitterness? So when crosses are presented, Christians almost always have a choice. They can turn away. They can refuse to take the cross. But of course, doing so would mean betraying. Betraying trust, giving up the gospel, giving, you know, consciously going against God's law, or something like that. Christians are not meant to seek crosses for themselves, but when the cross is presented for them, they will take it. All people suffer, but only Christian people's suffering can be called bearing the cross. So bearing the cross is not automatically a synonym for any kind of human misery. There is actually blessing in bearing the cross, which comes from the closeness with Jesus that follows. While bearing the cross will not make oneself constantly to be happy, it does open the door to such joy that can only be found in those living close to God. Paraphrasing C.S. Lewis, it is like sickness, but better than health. Martin Luther, a man who bore the cross in his life as well, understood the spiritual value of cross being more necessary than food and drink, he wrote it. One should not qualify suffering too much in itself, though. While suffering may tear down some self-deception, maybe provide some character development, the true blessing in bearing of the cross does not come directly from the suffering itself, but rather from God's faithfulness in the midst of suffering. From 2 Corinthians, Paul writes, We were so utterly burdened beyond our strength, that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. So if you look at simply the fact that they suffered, that in itself didn't do any good. But through that suffering, they came to rely on God. That they came to know that God raises the dead, God took care of them. Luther described the spiritual growth of a Christian through three stages. And he talked about prayer, meditation, and perhaps something which could be called testing. Uh, what is important in Luther's idea is that this final stage, which is called testing, this testing happens only after God's word has been heard and received with faith. There has been prayer, there has been meditation on God's word, and it has been put into action in one's life. Only Christian people are truly tested. Only those who follow God's word are being tested. And secondly, what is more important even, is that what is being tested is not truly the individual believer's strength of faith, but rather the trustworthiness of God's promise. When following Christ puts the Christian <clears throat> in a tight spot and then again delivers him through it, God's promises have been tested and shown to stand the test. What does not kill us makes us stronger is true in the sense that suffering strengthens trust to God's faithfulness. As Paul writes, showing that the end result is hope in God's love, he writes, we, re we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. So you have to be kind of careful with this, <clears throat> with this idea that suffering is, is good for a Christian. That the point is not that we are producing some sort of super-Christians. Who, who become so mighty and strong that nothing you know, burdens them anymore, but rather through suffering, Christian is time and time again shown that God is faithful in his promises. And what is really being tested is 
is, is God's faithfulness. This is a, a, a bit different aspect in the, looking at that thing. That God allows Christians to end up in trouble so that he can once again show that he is the God who delivers them from all, all affliction and, and, and temptation. And that way, yeah. That statement, what does not kill us makes us stronger, that's not from the Bible. No, no, that's pretty neat. That's from Crystal Holder's life. She says it all the time. Yeah. Yeah, it's Friedrich Nietzsche, who was completely anti-Christian. And right after that, it com and right after that it comes, oh, this is one of the crosses I am, I have to bear. Right. Well, I mean, you know, you can use this sort of sayings with a little bit of a, have to edit you know, footmark there. <laughs> that uh, it is true in the sense that it makes you trust in God's strength more. Mm -hmm. And that, that way it makes your faith stronger. But when we say that you have a strong faith, we don't mean that you become you know, some sort of a titan or a giant. But rather, a strong faith is the kind of faith which expects from God great things, right? So a strong faith, you could even say, in some sense, a strong faith makes a person himself or herself to be a very weak person. You grow smaller and Jesus grows bigger. <clears throat> to, to borrow what, 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 what uh, John the Baptist was saying. So that's what happens, is that a, a, a God, or our trust in God, becomes stronger. Isn't there sometimes a danger that, if you know, we, we, we share bear our crosses, and, um, which is good when we want to do it, and if we have, if we should want to do that if there's, like, let's say, a congregation situation where you could always do more, and more, and, and as you see yourself already suffering, you could still go on because you see it's for the benefit perhaps of someone. But at the same time, it's it's very heavy to bear. And there's also points, right, where it's too heavy for us to bear, not any more beneficial. And it's hard, for, for me, it's hard to, to determine when there is this point of, this is like good bearing of the process, and this is like too much, and now it's it would be irresponsible of not taking care of yourself. <clears throat> yeah, I think you have to take care of yourself, but not at the cost of someone else. I guess that's kind of a, it would really depend on the situation. Right, because you could always you have be. more, right? Like you could always do more for others, which would be beneficial, and if you don't do it anymore, it would be kind of on their cost. Mm. Not perhaps in the negative sense, but <coughs> in the adding positive. Right. And, yeah, I think that's, that's a point where you have to think in long term also that if you if you die of your you know cross bearing or but I mean we people generally we are you know lazy and selfish and and I'm always a little bit you know skeptical about this language you know you read in famous magazines that remember to love yourself kind of stuff. That you know, all people remember to love themselves. Usually, <laughs> that's 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 not the big problem this world is struggling with. Usually, the big problem we are struggling with is that we don't love and take care of other people. Of course, what you say, there, there is cases where people can overstretch themselves and they they you know they get burned out, and then you say that this was not for the benefit of anybody. That you know you work so much that you went into hospital. So, so yeah, I, I think there is indeed there comes cases where you have to say no, simply to preserve yourself. And of course, it would be best if other people would see it also, and, and they would say on, on your behalf, that don't do it anymore. But I think in, in general, I would say that the one who takes upon a cross can also trust that Jesus gives strength for bearing the cross which might be also something which is discovered only once the cross has been taken. That from beforehand it seems like there's no way we'll get through this, or no way I'll, I'll make this work. But once you are there, because you realize, if I'm not going to do this, if no one's going to do this, and it just landed on me. And when you go there, and then you realize that Jesus did give you strength for that as well. But it's, it's, a, it's a good question, and it's not easy to answer. I, I think it would really depend on the situation. Christian suffering is not always cause of the devil. 
But the devil certainly becomes a source for many crosses Christians must bear. And here one again must be careful. It is true that God shows his almighty power by forcing even the devil to ultimately serve his plans. And the temptations of the devil certainly can be a training ground where Christians learn to trust Christ more deeply. As Luther writes, whoever suffers from the devil here will not suffer from him yonder. On the other hand, the works of the devil are never good in themselves, and they are always directed against God's works. They can be beneficial to the Christian only in a secondary sense, as occasions for God to show his grace. In themselves, they are evil and dangerous, and the devil remains God's enemy. So we do not want to glorify uh, devil's works, we do not want to glorify suffering in general. Suffering is bad. But suffering is a place where God reveals himself, and, and we come to know God intimately in the midst of suffering. So in that sense, a bad thing works for the good in the end. Okay, let's talk about Jesus then. This is the time of the season, uh, time of the year when we talk about Christ's mission against the devil. First John uh, 3 says very concisely, the, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. And this is Apostle John's words which are presented in the context where the devil is described as the one who has been sinning from the beginning. The devil was the instigator of mankind's fall into sin. And ever since, God has been working to save those whom the devil brought to ruin through sin. In the history of Christian thought, there has been many viewpoints into the work of Christ. This is understandable since no description can ever fully exhaust the magnitude of the salvation Jesus accomplishes by taking upon himself all the sins of the human race and suffers punishment on their behalf. Two main viewpoints you, you could use to talk about what happened and what, what's the benefit of Easter. Uh, first would be the relationship between mankind and God. And in that relationship, Christ's work answers the question of, you could say, it solves the problem of guilt, penalty, and separation. Christ atones men with God, takes away their punishment and guilt of their sins, and restores the connection with men and God. So from this viewpoint, mankind is the guilty party who receives mercy because of God's love. You know, God is the one who has been wronged, we are the evildoers, but because of Jesus' work, Christ's, uh, Christ's love towards us and his redeeming death, we are set right with God again. The same event can also be observed through the relationship between mankind and the devil. And here Christ's work then comes to answer the problem of spiritual slavery, into which human race had been bound due to their sin. Men, while still being sinners and definitely, you know, under condemnation, are also, in a way, victims of the devil's work and in need of a savior. So, you know, like Adam and Eve were deceived by the devil and, and tempted by the devil into sin. And then after that, the devil has kept them in. In, in his clutches, and they needed Jesus to come to their save, salvation. And these two viewpoints are not opposite, or even alternative, but rather parallel. Both, at the same time, are true, only looking at the same event from two different points. Their connection is the fact that Christ dies for the sins of the world. In relation to God, that brings forgiveness. In relation to the devil, that brings freedom. And if you read Luther's large catechism, for example, it's kind of interesting if, if, you, if you look at the second article where he talks about, or the second article of, of Creed, where he talks about the work of Christ. And, and Luther mainly focuses on, he, he does it, he, he does it with, with these key words. And his key word for the second article of the Creed is Lord. And he tries to explain what does it mean that Jesus has become my Lord. And Luther's idea is that before, we were all held under the bondage of the devil, and devil is described as a, a tyrant. 
And when Christ comes and defeats the devil's power and takes us into his kingdom and he becomes our Lord. Of course, Luther, you know, he doesn't have this, this idea that we, have, we would be free individuals, you know, making our way out there. Uh, he always thinks that you are under somebody's lordship. And before you were ruled by a tyrannical power of the devil, but then after Christ has defeated the devil, you have been taken into his glorious kingdom where you live in grace and, and, and peace under, and the, under this benevolent ruler of Christ. And, and that's pretty interesting. I, I encourage you to read it sometime, how, how Luther looks at the work of the cross very strongly from the viewpoint of de devil's uh, bondage being broken over us. Spiritual life, therefore, is not a, if you could call it a bipolar relationship, <coughs> which is always only about man and God, you and Jesus kind of a relationship. Uh, and if you look at it only purely in that sense, I think it's sometimes prone to create problems if in Christians' view of God, because it may lead into thinking that God is always and only standing opposite to me. Actually, spiritual life is a three-piece setting, with God, man, and the devil, all affecting the situation. When the devil is included in the spiritual understanding, the relationship between God and man in the devotion deepens. God certainly is the one to whom men must give account and whose forgiveness they should ask. And in that sense, they always stand in front of God, and he stands opposite to them. However, Christ also stands beside them, or they can even stand behind Christ when facing the devil. So it's like a, the kind of idea, can you say that God is on your side? If there's only two of you, you know, there's God and there's me, you, it's always God is opposite to me and we have a relationship with each other. But when you have the third party, the devil, you can always say, well, God and me, we are on the same side together against the devil. And, and, and the setting changes. Okay, it's not revolutionary, but I think it's a, it's a good thing to keep in mind that Spiritual life for a Christian is a three-dimensional thing, or there's two relationships, you and the devil, you and God. Yes, we, we can compare that to a situation in court. The devil is our enemy, is our, who, who accuses us. Right. God, the Father is the judge, and Jesus is our lawyer. He, he is our advocate who speaks for us. Yeah. Actually, Holy Spirit is called paraclete, which means very exactly the, the defense lawyer in court. Mm. Okay. Him too. Yeah, him too. <laughs> okay. The fight between Christ and the devil is woven in the Gospels all the time. When you read the, read the Gospels, devil comes, the demons come up all the time. Jesus starts to encounter possessed people, that is, demoniacs, as soon as his public ministry begins. It seems that the presence of Christ draws out the demons. Perhaps they rise to oppose him in whatever way they can, or perhaps they are forced to come out of hiding whenever Jesus appears. In any case, encounters such as the gathering man with a legion of demons in him, these follow Jesus' ministry all along. Many of the illnesses Jesus cured were actually caused by demons such as muteness, epileptic fits, disability of body, etc. Not, of course, um, it doesn't mean that all the illnesses were caused by demons, but sometimes they were. This seemed to be such a central part of Christ's ministry that he summarized his work when Herod's men were drawing near. Go and tell that fox, behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I finish my course. So it really is central to his task, that he wants to cast out demons. Christ commanded his disciples to cast out demons and give them the authority to do so when he sent them to the Galilean villages to proclaim God's kingdom. This being not a one-time event, but a continuing sign which accompanied the Church of Christ as she continued to spread the gospel of Christ, as Mark 16 says. These are the signs that follow them. There are many, among many others, there is that they cast out evil spirits. The devil is the strong man mentioned in Matthew 12, who keeps his possessions safely under his control, that is, the souls of men, 
until Christ, who is the one stronger than him, the, the even stronger man, who attacks then him and takes away his weapons. As Hebrews puts it, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he, that is Jesus himself, likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. The devil also resisted Christ's work. He is the one who takes away the word from their hearts so that they might not believe, that's the, from the parable of the sower, thus hindering Jesus' teaching ministry by sowing tares among the wheat. The devil attacked Christ himself as well through temptation in the wilderness and later through the mouth of Peter trying to persuade him to reject the cross. I don't think it's Jesus just losing his temper when he says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. But that there actually was a demoniac or a demonic temptation hurled at him through the mouth of Peter. Christ's temptation in the wilderness is always described as following immediately after his baptism of Jordan. And it's a very interesting story. Not only does this reveal to Christians the unavoidable fight that follows their faith, you know, it, it means when, when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went to be tempted by the devil, and so likewise, whenever a Christian is baptized, he enters, he or she enters a lifelong fight with the devil. Um, so indeed, it, it shows how the battle with the devil is the, um, a part of Christian life, but it also shows how fighting the devil is the first, and in that sense, the foundational confrontation, and thus characterizes Christ's entire ministry. Indeed, the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. Through his work and the work of his disciples, he sees Satan fall like lightning from heaven. The wilderness temptations, which all the synoptics tell, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all tell about Jesus in the wilderness, they have sometimes been used poorly in devotion or, or sermons as an example to be imitated, a case study of how each Christian could defeat the power of the devil in their lives by wise and brave use of scriptures. Of course, like all works of Christ, this too contains some exhortation for us, and a model to follow or, or an example to imitate. There's no, no problem with that. But the main message is much greater. When Jesus enters the temptation and defeats the devil, he does what no human being has ever been able to do before that, and will never be able to do after that on their own, no matter how Bible savvy they might be. The law speaks of the works of Christ so you can imitate them, but the gospel reveals the works done already on your behalf. Christ certainly does empower Christians to resist the devil, but only because he himself has already defeated the power of the evil one. And he is present in and among his believers. Gospel-centered view of the demonic does not focus on what could be done or should be done, but rests on the foundation of what has already been done and can never be undone. Jesus Christ has defeated the power of, of the devil. And, and that needs to be very, said very loud and clear as the foundation on which anything else we, we can say about this, this area is built on. But Jesus Christ is mightier than, than the devil and he has already crushed the serpent's head defeat the power of death and hell and so on. And, and from that we can move forward to talk about how, how the devil affects us and how we fight the good fight. So I guess for my looking at it is all of these things that, are, that have been said and all of these wonderful things that Christ has done like defeating the devil it only benefits us when we believe. So to, this all is meaningless to the unbeliever. Yeah, to most extent. Uh, the least, unbeliever does not get any of those benefits. Yeah, I would say so, because these are actually, it's Jesus who defeated the devil, not us. And, and when we believe, we are with Jesus, and Jesus is with us. So we are with the winner. Yeah. That's true. And Paul also says that, actually. 
he says that um, he's talking about the Christians who previously it was actually Peter. Well, anyhow, uh, who previously were following the, the spirit, which still is in power on those believe, people who don't believe. So Paul is, is kind of having the, this understanding that the unbelievers are, are still led, led by the power of this world, or by the devil, yeah. like, like he wants. And, and Christians have been free they, that. They just don't know it. Mm. And the, the, we as believers, we are constantly on, on, always a, uh, aware of that we have fallen into sin and failed. And yeah. then through forgiveness and uh, repentance. Right. And this is again what, what we spoke about earlier also is that the Christian, Christian peace can be very turbulent in its nature. That Christians who have the peace of Christ, they live in a life which is full of some kind of struggle or tension with sin with temptation, with the devil, and it can sometimes even feel that, you know, this peace of Christ isn't making me terribly peaceful, but it is the fact that, that the peace other people might might sometimes have is, is false peace, yeah. which is, you know, like devil's propaganda, that everything is well. The only peace you really have is faith in Christ. Indeed, in any, any lasting peace, that is. That's right. Okay, let's now talk about the black devil and the white devil. Oh. This is a... This is not racist, is it? It's a little red devil. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let, let the one who edits this video edit that out. <laughs> Martin Luther has a good way with words. I like his, his, his very quotable guy. <clears throat> in, in the time he was writing, a common saying went, where God builds his church, the devil builds a tavern. Yep. Um, but Luther modified that. I like the picture. Yeah. Luther modified it by saying, where God builds his church, the devil builds a chapel. And this tweak, how Luther turns, the, turns tavern into a chapel, reveals how Luther understood the devil's, you could say, two-pronged work which Luther then calls the black devil and the white devil. That is a reference to the church, the Catholic church. No, no, it's more of a general, no, he doesn't talk about Catholic church there. No, it wouldn't be a reference, like a reference to it? I don't think so. Well, I wonder, because a chapel, you know, he could be referring to what the Pope teaches compared to what we, do, we would probably have to look what Luther, what's the context where Luther talks about it. Does that maybe refer to the, this chapel, refer to the devil's deception of the, or his, when he tries to deceive us? Yeah, indeed. And that's what we, we get into very soon. But let's look at the tavern first. Okay. On the very, very basic level, what, what we could call the black devil, the devil tempts all people into various sins worldliness, and thus produces all kinds of suffering, ranging from civil unrest to divorce, murder to famine. If God is indeed the giver of all, all good things, the creator who continuously creates and sustains his creation, then the devil is always at work trying to destroy his good gifts. When in large catechism Luther explains uh, what it means to, uh, to pray that God would give us this day our daily bread, he gives a pretty comprehensive description of the many ways in which the devil seeks to attack God's creation. He writes, For all this thought and desire, for all his thought and desire is to deprive us of all that we have from God, or to hinder it. And he is not satisfied to obstruct and destroy spiritual government in leading souls astray by his lies and bringing them under his power, but he also prevents and hinders the, st the stability of all government and honorable, peaceable relations on earth. There he causes so much contention, murder, sedition and war, also lightning and hail to destroy grain and cattle, to poison the air, etc. In short, he is sorry that anyone has a morsel of bread from God and eats it in peace, and if it were in his power, and our prayer next to God did not prevent him, we would, keep, we would not keep a straw in the field, a farthing in the house, Yea, not even our life for an hour, especially those who have the word of God and would like to be Christians. So it really is 
pretty comprehensive idea. The devil causes all kinds of misery, not only spiritual, but, but all sorts of uh, suffering and, and, and murder and, and sin and everything. The other way of attack is, however, much more danger dangerous and much more persuasive. The devil is not content on simply building a tavern to compete with God's church, but indeed he sets up a chapel. And that's where the white devil preaches. He makes himself appear as an angel of light, as Paul calls it, calls it in 2 Corinthians 11, in order to lead people not only into bad life, but also false faith and worship. And this happens on a corporate level just as well as in individual life of faith. If the devil cannot destroy the church through persecution, he tries to shatter it through arguments, lead it into false doctrine, or completely silence the preaching of the gospel within her. The devil most strongly attacks those things that make the church such a dangerous enemy to him. The preaching of the word, the administration of the sacraments, the doctrine of the gospel, etc. He tries to muddle every theological issue with endless questions until the church is so disarrayed that she begins to be governed by power rather than truth, thus opening the way for the black devil to sow sedition and envy among the princes of the church. This kind of a fallen church he then uses to discredit or even persecute through Christians, as happened in the turbulent years of Reformation by the papal church. On the level of an individual, the, the white devil uses various tricks to bring down his heart. And when we talk about white devil, we talk about the devil who appears in the area of faith. One thing he does is he tries to lead people into pride. False sense of personal holiness makes a Pharisee. And with the help from the white devil, the person is tempted into spiritual pride, which, while maintaining the appearance of godliness, is internally full of sin and unbelief. Such a person, person can also become a true stumbling block for others. This kind of temptation can even strengthen the external religiosity, not by true good works, but through self-chosen display of man-made piety. The attention gets drawn more and more to such human regulations, and at the same time, true repentance becomes more and more rare. After all, when the actual law of God is not preached, but only human opinions and traditions, then no piercing of the heart takes place either. So the white devil uh, makes you to be a white Pharisee as well. Or he makes you, quite on the contrary, to despair. And here a double tactic is used by the devil, and we'll talk about that more in the next chapter. First, tempting men into sin with the old lie, surely you shall not die. And once sin is committed, turn around and begin accusing the devil tries to make man focused on his sins rather than God, and finally in despair turn away from God or even take their own life. So the white devil indeed, he either he appears as the angel of light, complimenting you until you become a Pharisee, or attacking you until you despair. He tries to appear so holy that you know he's holier than you and probably holier than God even. And he just tells you endlessly how bad you are. Oh, he's going to say, oh, that wasn't so bad. Yeah, yeah, but that's that's maybe the first first option. That that's the pride, pride, pride side of things. So let's talk about the kind of attacks I, I title here the ordinary attacks, which means the attacks all Christians can face, which is sort of. The, the kind of things devil quite constantly throws at believers. Every Christian bears the cross and also every Christian is attacked by the devil. There is nothing extraordinary or alarming in being troubled by the evil one. Actually, in some sobering sense, it is a sign that faith is alive and active. Already the Desert Fathers of the ancient church and countless Christian devotional writers ever since have understood that the devil's attacks do not land heaviest there where sin and unbelief already reign, they focus on believers. Like Luther said quite many times in different forms, that if you are being attacked by the devil, it's a good sign that you are doing something right. 
These attacks vary in, in their strength, and likewise they, the way Christian experiences them will vary. To be troubled by them is not necessarily a bad sign, but neither is it automatically a cause to worry if such attacks are not deeply felt. Some Christians have, by God's grace, a thicker skin against these attacks, which of course is not the same thing as being uncaring or apathetic in spiritual matters. And those who experience them more strongly can, on the other hand, be finer vessels meant for using God's plan where such sensitivity is called forth. So there's different kinds of people, different kinds of Christians. Some feel these things heavier than others, and, and either way it's not to be alarmed with. It would be impossible to make an exhaustive list of all the areas or ways that they will attack Christians. Still, some main or most often recurring topics could be named. Satan very often focuses his, attack, his attacks on vocation, since that is also where God's call to service most clearly comes to the Christian. Certainly the devil is happy for all kinds of sin, but the most misery is usually caused when people neglect and become corrupted in those tasks which are most peculiar to them, because through those callings God wanted to give most of his blessings to others. When Christians fight the good fight against the demons, they should be aware of this and realize that although temptations and hindrances can and will come in all areas of life, the struggles will likely be strongest in those tasks to which they are specifically called. So, a pastor, for example, is in a very crucial role in God's you know, plan. He probably will find most attacks of the devil and most temptations come in a way which somehow has to do with pastoral office. A parent will feel special attacks in the area of parenting, out of despair or frustration or, or this or that. A, a, a magist magistrate probably will feel strong corruptive power of, of politics and, and trying to you know, make himself his godly principles and so on. A person who is in a special position will probably face strongest temptations in connection with that position. There will be an attack through worldliness. Sometimes the devil shows all the kingdoms of the world. That is, he promises life of happiness, joy and security if the Christian turns away from God. Of course, this temptation very rarely comes like Goethe's Mephistopheles, offering a clear bargain, you know, just write it with blood and you'll have this much money. But rather, in a more concealed way, it begins with the idea that Christians can live and should be allowed to live just like everyone else, without the cross and shame of confessing Christ or the sacrifices their faith would seem to demand. Example. My son must be allowed to go to soccer practice every Sunday morning, even if he misses the church. Otherwise, he won't have the same opportunity to become a professional athlete. And that would be unfair. You can't ask him to sacrifice his hobby in order to go to church. Just to take an example, you know, you could have endless examples, but the, the sense of entitlement that I must be allowed to do what everybody else does, have all the same opportunities in my life and not be held back by Jesus, and if, if so, it's unfair. And this is then followed by the idea that actually, faith in God doesn't really have anything special to offer in real life. You know, what's the benefit of, of following Jesus? It doesn't really give anything to me, and of course, how could it? Because this faith has already been stripped of, uh, stripped of any real meaning at this point. And then one actually doesn't need God to be happy. Such faith is eventually either given up since it's meaningless, or kept as a keepsake from one's childhood home, or a symbol of German cultural heritage, in case of many Lutherans. Another attack comes in the shape of despair, and this was already briefly touched about. Here the devil most clearly mixes truth with lies. And that's, you know, how did it go? <laughs> was it Goebbels who said it or who? That, you know, the best, best lies are the ones where you have a little bit of truth in them. 
And, and here the devil uh, speaks truth when it comes to convict, convicting sins. But he lies when drawing conclusions that God is hate. So basically the devil condemns man from, of their sins. And which often time he doesn't even have to make anything up. He can just point to very real things you know are true. But then when he moves from that to say that God hates you, that's where he begins to lie, obviously, because God doesn't hate him. Um, the short-term result of such devilish attack might be even that the person keeps on going back to the word of God, prayer, etc., even more fervently as before. So it doesn't necessarily immediately drive you away from, from, the, from the word of God. It might uh, make you, like Luther, confess your sins you know, ten times a day run into absolution and back, you know, study your scriptures so that the, so that the covers fall off, uh, be on your knees on prayer so that, you know, there comes two little bumps on, on, the, on the floorboards where your knees used to, used to be. And in that sense, okay, it doesn't sound too bad, but all this is done ultimately out of fear, guilt and shame. As weeks, months and years follow each other, this kind of faith, driven by constant fear and guilt, will become too much for the Christian to bear. They fall into despair, and many of such people simply reject their faith. Faith which in their experience had become a horrible burden to bear. No one, no one can handle life which is constantly characterized by feeling of utter worthlessness. And, and despair, and, and it, you, you can't go on living like that. It's either you go into, into crazy house, or, or you give up your faith. And many people who grow up in, in very legalistic background, in, 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 in Christian backgrounds where, where the gospel of Christ is not clearly preached, and it all revolves around what, what kind of a good Christian you should be, and, and at least you should become one very soon, these people Either they become Pharisees, or they give up faith altogether. And they give it up because they just can't go on living like that. That truly is a place where the devil's despair has done its work. And finally, among attacks not often seen, maybe devilish, is one I want to mention, which is melancholy. Christitia in Latin. Which can set in, both in one's life of faith as well as life in general. Luther called the devil a spirit of sadness because he is an enemy of every true God-given joy. In this kind of devilish melancholy, just as well as in devilish guilt, a true testing question is always to ask, is this driving you closer to Christ or further away from it is true that God's Holy Spirit uses the law to make you despair, but always with the purpose that through that experience of despair you cling to Christ closer. That you once again realize that your own attempts won't save you, but Jesus is the great friend of all sinners. If that doesn't happen, if you're actually driven further away from Jesus, then it's not from God. It's not from the Holy Spirit. That's like if you just want it very plain and simple. If it's, if it's taking you closer to Jesus, it's from God. If it's driving you away from Jesus, it's from the devil. And that's, you have to ask that question, because when it comes to you, the, the devilish guilt, just as well as devilish sadness, can, can be thought of being true work of the Holy Spirit, that he's, he's convicting me of sin, he's, he's leading me into repentance here. And, 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 and therefore you can be fooled into thinking that this is actually God-pleasing, when devil does it. But it's not, it's, it's, it's driving you further away from God, never close. And godly grief makes Christians cling to the cross of Christ as their consolation uh, and sign of hope. 
sure promise of great things to come. Devilish melancholy produces just apathy, passivity, seclusion, and despair. And melancholy is a little bit different from despair. Despair is kind of this Sturm und Drang, this, uh, <clears throat> this, this, this horror. Whereas melancholy is, is not horror, it's not really anything. I, I really like, like how much you can like these things, but I think Dorothy L. Sayers said it well. The sixth deadly sin is named by the church Acadia or Sloth. In, in the world it calls itself tolerance, but in hell it is called despair. It is the accomplice of the other sins and their worst punishment. It is the sin that believes in nothing, cares for nothing, seeks to know nothing, interferes with nothing, enjoys nothing, loves nothing, hates nothing, finds purpose in nothing, lives for nothing, and remains alive only because there is nothing it would die for. We have known it far too well for many years. The only thing perhaps that we have not known about it is that it is a moral sin. So there is this kind of despair and melancholy which can set in people. In an age where psychology did not properly even exist, Luther actually had to deal with lots of people who wrote to him. There's, there's some compilations they made, this kind of Luther's uh, letters, you know, his correspondence, where he, he writes with people who sent him letters about what to do and how to handle these things, and, and just seeking consolation. It's pretty, pretty interesting stuff to read. Uh, and indeed, Luther was in count, countless letters writing to people who suffered from what today would probably be classified as depression. Although Luther understood there to be a real spiritual temptation included within that, and the temptation to despair. His remedies, simple as they were, carry practical wisdom. First, do not focus on the devil's attack. This may seem odd, considering the danger involved. Luther, however, understood that the greatest part of the devil's power actually comes from the person he tempts. And that's actually Pretty well there. The greatest power of the devil's power, act, the greatest part of the devil's power actually comes from the person he tempts. When they begin to focus on his attack, even becoming preoccupied with defeating it, his power over them increases. It's kind of like a fly in a web. You know, the more it more it tries to free itself, the more tangled it gets. Even if your intention is to fight the devil, you just get get. Uh, involved works. And Luther writes, the best counsel is this, do not struggle against your thoughts at all, but ignore them, and act as if you were not conscious of them. Luther advises thus, since dwelling on these thoughts, thoughts, wishing to conquer them, will only make them more disturbing and strengthen them. And I think there's probably something quite Feeling with modern understanding of psychology and, and therapy that, you know, what Luther basically says is that don't try to force yourself into defeating these thoughts. Just let them be and, and, and don't make a big deal out of them. Don't deny them, but don't focus on them either. Well, what should you focus on? Focus on God instead. The devil brings up sins only with the intention of driving the believer away from Christ. He raises theological questions not with the desire to learn, but with the desire to confuse. He displays the misery of the neighbor, not in order to rouse the Christian to works of mercy, but to fill them with despair and even anger. The devil can be best fought by focusing on God's word, prayer, singing hymns and using the sacraments, engaging in consoling discussions with other Christians, etc. To bring God in there and not try to defeat the devil on your own. And the third point, use God's good gifts. Satan can sometimes use God's pleasant creation to distract, but ultimately he is unable to give anything truly good. To use God's good gifts also in the area of creation is a remedy against the spirit of sadness. For Luther, this often meant playing music. With the help of music, the evil thoughts could be driven away. Of course, for Luther, music probably also often meant, meant hymn singing. 
that they were, the word of God also included it. Sometimes good food and fun games were needed. Luther wrote, whenever the devil pesters you with these thoughts, this is also from his letter to, to some person who was, you know, in this kind of melancholy. Whenever the devil pesters you with these thoughts, at once seek out the company of men. Drink more, joke and jest, or engage in some other form of merriment. Especially important to Luther was the company of other people. He says, when we are alone, the worst and saddest things come to mind. As it usually is with people who suffer from melancholy, they need the company of others, but also avoid it. Luther wrote to a wife of an afflicted man. Solitude is poison for him. For this reason, the devil drives him to it. So, you kind of, you kind of have to like it. Uh, you don't have to like it. I, li I like it. Uh, in the sense that there is a this sort of very practical aspects in Luther's advice he gives to people who are uh, in, in this sort of a trap of melancholy or despair by the devil. How does he get around the fact that we're supposed to be sober and uh, we're not supposed to joke and jest frivolously? Well, probably you don't need to sit in there, but you can still joke and jest, right? You can well, play games and... What, what kind of... But they don't that. What you're talking about. Joking jokes. Well, I know you joke. <laughs> yeah. I think that's probably what... depends on the joking, yeah. Yes. Yes, of so course, you can use drink, drinks. You're drinking and, and eating uh, more. Uh, you're talking, you know, you're getting into gluttony, etc. Well, I don't you're think... Gonna, I don't think he's me. You haven't had to qualify this, but I think. Yeah. You know, because you, you can take this to the extreme, right? Right. Well, this is a practical advice Luther wrote to a certain situation. Uh, that uh, where a person loses, you know, seeks solitude and, and broods in dark thoughts alone. To get away from that is to go where there's fun to be had. Well, I know that... Uh, Change your thought process. Yeah, and, and sort of like... I think that's a, that is a... That is theologically, I think, actually pretty important thing. The devil does not give any real pleasures to people. He only gives fake copies of God's pleasures, um, but he cannot truly create anything good or, or, or beautiful or pleasant on his own. And whenever you are engaging in, in you know, company of others, you know, let's not, let's not think that they are intoxicated or or gluttonous, but just let's think that they are eating good food with good friends, uh, you know, listening to nice music and singing together, uh, and, and playing games and telling jokes, and everybody's having a very old time. That's actually, there's something godly in that, in the sense that these are God's created gifts, and using them is, is greatly troubling to the devil, also, because the devil cannot provide that kind of gifts. Sure enough, Richard, if there would be a case that people start misusing these gifts, then you have to qualify it. But I don't think in this, in this context that was, that was not something which was afraid, they were afraid of. Well, I think that's, that's misusing those situations is happening all the time. Mm. And it's up to us then to, uh, I guess what is called sober judgment, right? Right. To say, listen, I better get out of here. Yeah. Kind of thing. Yeah. Okay, these kind of things listed here, these kind of attacks, are probably something which all Christians in some sense are confronted with. They come almost to everyone. Uh, maybe not with all the time in the same power, but they do come. And then there's something which we could call the extraordinary attacks of the devil, which are not your normal bread and butter kind of a thing. Uh, they, they cannot be ignored even though they are rare. All Christians suffer from the devil in some way, but no one suffers in every way. Sometimes the demons take more direct route than their attack. Many Christians encounter at least some time in their life which could something which could be called spiritually oppressive moments. This is something that goes above and beyond the normal temptations they bear with throughout their entire lives. There comes a time when the devil presses down on them hard. Saying when it rains, it pours sometimes describes these moments. Christians find themselves bombarded by one problem after another, wearing them down and taking the joy out of their lives. 
or there comes such burden of conscience that suddenly all promises of the gospel are almost forgotten. The trust and joy in God disappear. Sometimes they, they can be infested with truly horrible thoughts of sins they normally are not at all tempted to commit. Sometimes even blasphemous words or actions come to their mind and they cannot explain where they originate. Sometimes it truly feels as if someone else is whispering these ideas into their ears and hearts. This may very well be a true attack of the devil. These disturbing images, thoughts and suggestions should not be a cause of shame or fear. They come from outside, from the devil. Even though our experience might be that it is somehow our own sinful heart that conjures such things, still their source is outside of us. Sometimes, especially when some great task is at hand in God's service, and many pastors have experienced this, uh, there may come times of insomnia or nightmares, sickness and fatigue, unexplainable irritation or conflict with family members, etc. That's something I think all Christians can sometimes be attacked with, something like this, but not, not all the time and not every Christian. Then there are demonic manifestations of more clearly perceivable nature. Physical objects move on their own, or disturbing, unexplainable sounds or voices are heard. German poltergeist literally meaning a raw loud rumbling spirit. Apparitions are seen, obnoxious smells or sudden coldness is experienced, etc. Again, while such events are not common, they are not as rare as one might think. Uh, simply the threshold of speaking about such things publicly means they mostly stay hidden. And they don't also, sadly, stay only in Africa or Asia. They also exist in Western countries. Anecdotally, it might be interesting to know that this kind of stuff happened to Luther as well. And it seems to some special intensity was connected with his work in translating the Bible into German. It might be that the devil was very horrified by the idea that Germans would receive that their God's word in their own language. At times in Wartburg Castle, Luther would wake up in the middle of the night when his bed would be shaken by an unseen power. Objects on the table would move without reason. It seems like objects on my table move sometimes without reason when I'm not looking at them. <laughs> and suddenly they're in different places. Well, that's not what it's meant here. Uh, table, uh, things would move without reason. There would be terrible noises in the hallway outside his study. Luther's own response was to ignore the devil and continue with his work. Like sometimes he said that when he was sleeping and, and he heard some horrible ruckus in the, in the hallway uh, and then he got up, this is how the anecdote goes, then, then he got up and he saw it was the devil and then he said, oh devil, if I knew it was you, I wouldn't have bothered getting up. So he's, you know, that's how he went back to his bed to sleep so that he can continue translating Bible next day. Like Luther's example shows, sometimes these kind of events are direct attacks against people in God's kingdom, perhaps with the intention of scaring them into silence or just wearing them down so that they can work no more. Christians need not be afraid if such events happen. 1 John 4, little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Jesus Christ and his angels protect the church and the believers against the power of the demons. They might be confusing, but there is no real reason to be afraid. Probably more, more often, this kind of direct, visible manifestations of the devil attack people who are not believers. Sometimes these things begin to happen because of sins, especially sins of witchcraft and occult taking place. Ignorant or foolish people invite demons into their houses and light lives and into their houses and lives by dabbling with magical charms and spells, seances, occult literature, or even simply by purchasing items used for anti-Christian worship, such as idols of foreign religions, etc. Sometimes the persons suffering from such presence have no direct fault. Such demonic activity can, for example, be connected to a particular location because of what previous inhabitants did there, etc. In the most extreme cases, a demonic possession occurs. In de demonic possession, a demon takes hold of the person's body. This usually occurs in fits or attacks, with the person being able to function at least somewhat normally 
between attacks like that, like the boy Jesus healed after they came down from the Mount of Transfiguration, and the father said that the spirit that attacks him then and then and tries to make him fall into river, uh, water or fire. But apparently, otherwise, the son was able to go on you know, like normal. This kind of possession can bring uh, with it personality changes, odd behavior, memory loss, desperation, and depression, etc. At the times when the demon takes over its victim, it can speak with the person's mouth and demonstrate, for example, ability to speak in languages the person would not otherwise know, have knowledge of things the person would not know of, possess in human strength, etc. This is not common, obviously, but it happens. And just, just to say. And there is a nice thing in the final chapter. The church and Christians should be aware that these things are not common. Uh, should be aware of these things even though they are not common. And while they should not harbor unhealthy interest in this kind of events, they do exist. And the church has an answer to them. The church knows who her enemy is. And the Christians understand that there is indeed a reality of demonic powers at work in the unbelieving world. But the church also has an answer to this. The power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The devil is a liar and he lies not only about God but also and especially about himself. He wants people to think he still has the power over them. But in truth Christ has destroyed his power. It has been suggested that one of the many reasons Christianity originally spread so quickly in the ancient world was that Christians were not afraid of the demons. And they knew how to deal with them, with the name of Jesus. Baptism and faith bring peace with God and also power against the devil's tricks. Christians should not be foolishly arrogant, but neither should they be afraid of the devil. The power of the blood of Christ is greater than any demonic presence. A friend of mine had an exchange student in their house when he was growing up, a Taiwanese girl, a Chinese girl, and, and she was spending the whole year with the, with the family. And in Christmas time, on Christmas Eve, they went to church. And, and you feel that it's actually customary that on Christmas Eve, the, the cemetery would be immediately around the church, so when you go to the church, you go through the cemetery, and you also stop by the grave, to, if you have a family grave or something like that, and you put a candle there before you go in. And this Taiwanese girl was absolutely horrified by this practice. And her reason was simply this. These people go into the cemetery after sunset. And of course, they thought that you know, this is, of course, it's beautiful. We have, we have dead relatives here, and we, we show our respect and we remember them, and we also look towards the uh, resurrection. There's nothing to be afraid. This poor girl who had grown up in, in Taiwan, where the spirits are very real and, and, and afraid of, and demons are something that scare people, she wouldn't dare to enter. And that kind of is an eye opening thing of, of what is the difference between Christians and, and even, or, or pagans, when it comes to the world of spirits, that Christians don't have to be afraid. Uh, and, and that is a, a wonderful, wonderful thing. And then the church, when, when she does her work, and when Christians go into the world, we go there to help people who are afraid of, of demons. How is then the devil resisted? following James's advice, resist the devil and he will flee from you. In some sense, whenever the demonic attacks occur, they call for specific intensity in prayer, use of the word of God and sacraments, help from experienced pastors and intercession of the church at large. No Christian should take such things lightly, nor try to fight the devil without the help of other Christians. On the other hand, the nature of this battle is not ultimately anything different than simply the normal life of faith every Christian is living. In that sense, this entire course has been preparing us for this final lecture. Um, and, and answering the question of how do we fight the devil. The devil is resisted, 
through created good things. His sinful temptations are rebuked with the law of God. The gospel of Christ destroys his lies and accusations. The presence of the Son of God in them, in Christians, fills the believers so that the evil one cannot lay hold of them. He who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. A special role should still be given to the Church of Christ as the militant church, the church which has been mobilized to fight the devil in this world. According to a legend, and you know legends are as legends come, but it's maybe still nice to, re to repeat it. Uh, according to a legend that John of Posterno, an Orthodox saint, back in the day, you know, like 1500 years ago, um, once asked the demons what they were afraid in the Christians, and they answered, you truly have three great things. What you wear around your neck, what you wash yourselves with in the church, and what you eat when you gather together. The demons hate and fear, the cross, the baptism, and the Lord's Supper. Again, Christians have no right to be cocky when it comes to demons, but neither should they be terrified of them. If anything, the demons might be afraid of Christians. The encounters Jesus had with the demoniacs almost always had the demons wail and complain about their misery. This is not to say that the battle will be an easy one. The demons are persistent. And the devil continues to tempt and trouble Christians. But it is a battle where the outcome is certain. The triumph of Christ and the victory of his church, whom the gates of hell cannot prevail against. Thank you. Now, if you want to ask or, or I raise a question about something, I think we have a few minutes for that as well. Give thanks to the internet and turn this one off.